Hey everybody, welcome to the Particle Accelerator podcast, where we talk to future thinking business leaders about how to grow and accelerate their business. I'm here with Jeff. Uh, Jeff, why don't you introduce uh, yourself to the folks? Sure, Jeff Maines, CEO of Champion Leadership Group and uh, SaaS FinTech Intelligent Contacts. Cool, awesome. Uh, tell us a little more about SaaS Intelligent Contacts. Sure, it's a it's a SaaS fintech SaaS. The company name is Intelligent Contacts, mm-hmm. and so we're a fintech on the business side of healthcare. So we help hospitals, health systems, physician practices with one of the biggest challenges I think in healthcare, and that is billing. People love the experience with their doc, and that whole thing falls apart in the billing process. So we make the the billing process as great as the care experience itself. Awesome. All right. Well, let's get to know you a little bit. Um, I have a couple quick quick questions that are a little bit fun, but what was your first job? Wow. First job, first real job was scooping ice cream at Baskin Robbins before they did lawn mowing and and things like that. I've been, you know, working for a long, long time. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, Did you have a favorite flavor? Uh, I did when I first started working there and uh, within a couple of months, I was not a big fan of ice cream. (laughs) (laughs) Right. That makes sense. (laughs) Which is funny. They're like, eat all you want. So I was like, I'm done. Yeah, I'm a big mint chip fan. Um, what toy or hobby did you have as a kid that inspired what you do career wise today? I think you know a lot of it was very entrepreneurial growing up. So whether it was you know getting aluminum cans or you know selling things, buying things, trading, even trading lunch at school. I mean, very very entrepreneurial and always finding ways to make money. Uh, you know, music was something that I've done a lot. And so a lot of uh, guitar trading, buying, selling those kinds of things as well. And so I think just having a very entrepreneurial spirit has really prepared me for what I do today. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I was a paper boy. So I I definitely get that, (laughs) you know, had to do some some billing, had to do some collections. Yeah, Uh, that's good. Um, What was your favorite and least favorite course in college? Oh my gosh. Um, Favorite, we'll start with that. Uh, I I would say probably was uh, history and government. And a lot of that was because of the the professor that was doing it, just made it very interesting, made it uh, come alive. So something that could have been very dry and boring that that I thought going in wasn't at all. And so it was uh, really kind of instilled a a love of of that and history and just the the curiosity. Yeah. It was a, a big one. And the, the downer was calculus. Why a business major needs calculus, I have no idea. I've never used it since college. Uh, it took me three times. Uh, I never got an F. I got two Ds and I finally got the C. And so I, I took the, the book out and we had a celebratory fire. <laughs> that's right. Okay, <laughs> awesome. Uh, that's cool. Um, what, uh, what quote from a famous person lives rent-free in your mind? Wow, so many. Uh, I, I think one of the, the best ones is, uh, is whether you believe you can or believe you can't, you're right. Mm, yeah, I love that. Uh, we've been talking a lot about limiting beliefs. Um, you know, uh, yeah, just a lot about limiting beliefs. What you believe, you you go throughout the world to to find um, this, you know, my this will be pointed example, but my, uh, uh, my son doesn't have a, one of his testicles never descended. And he's like, dad, is this ever going to cause me a real, you know, real problem? I was like, probably the belief that it's going to cause you a problem is probably worse than the symptom itself. And he's sure. like, oh, okay, cool. So I just ignore it and then we'll deal with it <laughs> if it actually causes a problem. That's probably right. better than, um, and I think amputees and, and um, folks that that adapt to a handicap would probably also agree that the the belief that that limits them is probably worse than the actual uh limits that they that that they experience like just moving on with the with the limits but not um believing that they have greater limits than they actually do that's a great one um what was the greatest invention or discovery uh that you feel in the past 300 years (laughs) 300 years one that was really game changing when I was growing up was the the microwave, you know, something that was was you know, really revolutionary 
you know, think back, you know, what do we do before that? Uh, so that was one that uh, really, really big. And we could say, you know, phones and, and those kinds of things. But I think just from a, you know, convenience standpoint, that, you know, wasn't, uh, you know, cold coffee or, you know, heating up an oven to make food. Yeah, for sure. Love it. Um, always was a little worried about standing in front of it, but sure, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like we did, but we eat what comes out of it. So we might as well with it. Yeah. Um, so getting into the uh, business matter here, uh, what tech trend significantly impacted um, your industry and how did your company respond? Well, I think a lot in going from just the, the software industry in general, going from installed software to SaaS. And I've been in the, the SaaS world now for 20 plus years. And back before SaaS was even a thing, I mean, their Salesforce was very, very new and kind of the, the first anything. And uh, back when I started, it was ASP, you know, Application Service Provider. Mm -hmm. And so this magic thing called the cloud that nobody really understood or knew what was, or, you know, they could go look for their data outside. And so I think that was something, you know, it's just a big, big trend that uh, adjusted to got on board early. Uh, communications has certainly changed uh, as the internet has gotten faster and faster. Um, yeah, absolute game changer in the way that we communicate, not only over the phone, but also text and chat and just so many, so many people being connected all the time. And uh, so that is one of the things that is it's really driven a lot of the innovation uh, within our company. Uh, currently, I mean, AI, and we're betting big on AI and automation to to drive efficiencies and free up our people, but also our clients. And we promote our solutions as a people multiplier. I think AI has just accelerated that. And so you really free them up to focus on strategic initiatives. And that could be things like, you know, chatbots or some sort of an automated process that can streamline things that are redundant. Uh, AI assistants help scale support sales interactions, really important, but it, it's really the, the right technologies uh, for the specific needs. It's not you know, swinging all the way to say, hey, we're an AI first company because AI is cool. And it is, but it has to be the right tool for the job, not just a tool that's really cool and on the cutting edge to build a company around. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm finding that the uh, the business models or the the business ideas, um, the pitches that talk about replacing uh, a a function uh, are not going so well. But the people, the things that enhance a function are going much better. Yes. Um, more of a uh, you know more of a, a cyborg rather than a robot. Something that's yeah. working and enhancing the experience, not uh, not necessarily replacing it. I think uh, we have a client in the interior design space, and we're using AI to enhance the product recommendations, but not trying to replace interior design. Just trying to help them find the items, help them, you know, create the look that they want uh, more seamlessly. Um, but not trying to replace what the designer does, not trying to, uh, you know, take them out of the middle because art, I don't think art will be uh, susceptible to AI at any point in time because it's, uh, I, I think synthetic art is going to look, isn't going to look great. It's not going to appeal to us in the same way um, true art does. Yeah. There are things that, that AI is really good for, and there's things that it's, it's not good for yet that might be someday. And then there's things that will never be good for. Mm -hmm. yeah that that uh venn diagram um yes what are the th uh, three innovations you're betting on to drive your business growth well i think ai is definitely one of those and uh you know the the more you know automation so i think you know a lot of the the things are around that uh, and and so i think they they probably all would be ai related uh so you know driving support and so one of the things that we've done, uh, customers want answers and the, the quicker we can get them those answers, the better. So, you know, whether that is chatting with a real person or chatting with a, a bot that has access to the entire knowledge base and not just to say, uh, here's, here's an article, but actually to be able to source all that information and give them an answer that's intelligent mm -hmm. and, and just answer their question. So yeah. not just a link to here's a help document, go read this entire page and maybe you'll find the answer there. 
but to, to just bring back, you know, here's the, the answer for you. Right. The customer onboarding, the whole flow around customer onboarding and getting them familiar with your, your product, uh, getting them under to understand what's capable there. You just end up repeating yourself an awful lot. Yeah. Um, and there's also all, oftentimes the question from the customer is not asked in the best possible way. So there's clarifying questions and you just that there's a lot of iteration there in that communication that if a chatbot can, you know, jump in and help people get their answers, then everybody wins. Um, we would definitely see that as well. Yeah. That's helping our, our team get up to speed faster as well. So we can bring on somebody new and support. And not only do they have their team members and they have documentation and training and those kinds of things, but now they've got, you know, something that they can, a, a resource they can access to help them get the right answer. So mm -hmm. it, it's not only helping our, our clients get answers they want faster, but also helping our internal team uh, to do the same thing. And the same thing for sales, uh, really be able to get a, a complete picture of an account Instead of having to go to multiple systems or really think about, you know, here are all the things that I need to go look at and, oh, you know, what are the other contacts and but really have that, that complete picture of what's going on uh, very, very quickly. Or even be able to do research for outreach. You know, what used to take an hour can now be done in 60 seconds or less and, and really give a, a wrap, a very good picture uh, of an account. If we're looking at account-based marketing. Uh, you know, what, uh, what is likely to resonate with them? What's going on? What are the press releases? What are the things that they're doing? What are they searching for? There, there's so much data out there that's available that, that we can bring back and empower sales reps to have really meaningful conversations without doing hours of research. Yeah, I love that too. Plus, uh, we're getting a lot more value out of the verbal communication because we can take the transcript back into AI and produce meaningful things with it. Yeah. So we're able to have brainstorming discussions with our customers, um, just live brainstorming discussions and sales folks are coming back to the discussion with like, hey, here's the five bullet points that the customer has clearly asked for. And it's it's distilling it down. And there's this kind of brainstorming to written communication. And, and there's all that. That would normally be so lost because the sales guy is moving to the next call or the right. uh, the next scheduled meeting. And so he's not quite like he or she is able to just say, hey, here's the intel and give it to us in a way that we can go turn into roadmappable items. Um, and that gap is getting closed really quick. So yes. that, that kind of um, I use Claude a lot and Claude's prompt mechanic is an attachment. I so, so like that transcript, I just attach it in Claude and then I'm able to take, you know, some verbal brainstorming and materialize it into a uh, workable uh, to work product much faster. Yeah, I use Claude a lot. It's my favorite, favorite app. Me too. Cool. <laughs> uh, well, so what do you think some of the gaps are? Like, what are the most significant gaps between the, your ambitions and, and realities? Where do you see some gaps? Well, every organization wants to be data driven and, and we're no different. And it's like we're, we're sitting on an ocean of data. And if, if data is like the, the fish underneath us, we're you know, reaching down with a hand and, and, you know, every once in a while we'll pull up a fish and like, yay, we're data driven. But we know that there's a lot more down there. And so I think it's, it's really building the, the right pieces. And, and it's not necessarily infrastructure. It's more uh, having a more mature business intelligence, data analytics capabilities to turn those insights into action. So gather more of those those fish together from disparate sources, and and really turn it into something that that's meaningful. So every time we we dig deeper into data and become more data driven, we realize how much more we could be, and the pieces that are missing. And so we go another layer down, and then you know now we've got more, and then we realize well we don't know the answer to this question over here, but we probably have the data to find it, and so then we we create that. And so it's an iterative process. So I think that's that's a you know, a pretty significant gap, and it, it's a little bit difficult you know, as a, a leader. And, and I've had this conversation with other leaders that you know, it, it's an investment. You know, it's not something that you just do, and now we've got an immediate return, and and it's got this giant ROI. It's something that we build, and it it provides that intel over time. And some of it is that that we 
don't make as many bad decisions, but we don't necessarily know what would have happened if we made a different decision or had not made a data driven decision and just you know made a, a gut decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we were talking to a company the other day that m makes a, a a pretty decent amount of income on creating brochures, um, brochures for um, for patients who are engaged in some kind of pharma. You know, maybe they have that. Maybe it's chemotherapy, or maybe it's you know some um, illness where the the brochure is really important information, and and the 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 production cycle on on the the brochure production is is too long. So they're hearing things from patients. Um, they're not getting the brochures updated fast enough. So they're thinking, hey, what about a, a you know a chatbot? And what we what we kind of realize is that. Um, and my, my data science leader, he's he's good at kind of categorizing this, is we think of that experience up front that's going to be the chatbot experience. That's what most business leaders will think about is it would be really cool if my users could have this new AI-driven experience. But what we found is all data science projects end up with a collection and organization step. So, you know, um, like collecting from a bunch of brick and mortar locations and bring that data into a central point so that now you can organize it. And then now you can use some AI business analytics to understand and decide and interact with that data. But most data science projects, um, the user experience part sits on the, on the top. It's kind of the cherries on top of a really big uh, data project Sunday that needs collection and organization to be uh, worth the full taste. Sure. Um, and I think that's what you're uh, expressing also is, yes. you know, we got to do all this work to get to the good stuff where we can, can actually play with the data. Yeah. That is a gap. I think um, <laughs> and, and that is certainly a gap and that's uh, things people just, don't really understand the the four or five steps that it takes to get to the um, to the to, to the true business intelligence or the you know the magic as it would be. Um, what do you think the biggest challenge uh, for for you and maybe some of the people you work with for maintaining a competitive edge in your industry? What's the biggest challenge there? I think noise. You know, just it, the the market is getting noisier and noisier, and some of that has to do with AI. Uh, some of it, I think, is just the the world we live in. There's so many different communication channels. We're bombarded from with information from every side, and so you know the the biggest challenge is is standing out, and and being very clear on the problem that we solve, and who we solve it for. Is it's really easy to be general and say, you know, it's we're going to save you money, we're going to make you money, we're going to save you time. That's really, really generic, and and you know, that's what everybody says. Or you know, what is a competitive advantage? What should differentiate? Oh, it's our people, it's our service levels. It's just it's noise, but really having that that true competitive advantage that really matters to your ideal clients. That they look at that and they say, this is a, a problem that I have. You have the exact solution that I need. And, and this is amazingly, it's for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, so any tips and tricks on how to cut through the noise? I, I think clarity, really understanding uh, you know, what your business is, the problem that you solve and who you solve it for. And, you know, you think about even something like a, a database. Who can use that? Well, every business. Okay, so do you just market it as general or a CRM? Yeah, if you're trying to market a, a CRM today, you know, for just for the masses, good luck. But if you take that CRM and you say, okay, we're going to drill in and we're going to be just for agencies or we're going to be just for dental practices or this is a CRM for auto repair. Well, now we, you know, we're in something that is is much more well defined. One, you can market to that, you can message to it, and and they they look out there if they're looking for a CRM, they find you, and you know you're for them. And mm -hmm. so I think that's one of the ways that we really cut through the noise is not just being general, but being very very specific. Yeah, yeah. The the 
magic's in the niches um yes there's a rhyme there we could probably come up with but the uh the, there's something there about uh, the niche focus um you know when you first start your business you're wide because you just need to get revenue coming in but eventually you need to hone it in um and i'm certainly seeing with the other ceos i'm speaking to that that uh reigning in that focus is what's uh helping them go really serve the right people and um that's great how do, how do you approach risk management when implementing new technologies make a lot of small mistakes <laughs> yeah so we we do want to make a lot of uh, a lot of small bets and and really understand you know where you know, where the, the growth is likely to come from, where the, you know, what are the things that are likely to pay off? And then once we start seeing some, some traction there, once we start seeing some results, then, you know, continue to follow that and invest bigger and bigger and bigger. But yeah, I think it's, it's really making, uh, you know, big bets with small risk and small bets with bigger risk. And so really being able to to test both of those and figure out, you know, what is it that's likely to work in in our business? Uh, what is the, the right next step? And so thinking strategically and just making those bets and uh, and and following the things, you know, can, doing more of what works and, you know, stopping what doesn't and evaluating that pretty often. Yeah. I also have found that, um, you know, when you're like starting to systematize a part of your business, like maybe your hiring process or something. There's this, um, you know, we've kind of come across these uh, when it's internal, you're making these bigger changes like we rolled out a new scorecard system. But we immediately found that our, uh, our jump to change and then we started to learn things about that new process. So um, the kind of the feedback to ourselves was we really shouldn't hesitate to make the put these systems in place so that we can start to make the smaller corrections. Yes. Um, but if we if we wait to get the system in place and you know just kind of limp along, um, so like me, I think one way of saying it is making bigger change faster. Um, but I think that's uh, dovetails in with what you're saying because the sooner you can get a system in place to be able to monitor those small changes. Um, the more confident and that may seem like a big jump at first because you're going from something that's kind of unmanaged to managed uh but then you can make those small corrections and see what you know see what's going on right you'll learn things in doing that and taking that action that you would never learn in a bubble or waiting until it's perfect to roll it out yeah yeah well said um what advice can you share for connecting technology roadmaps with overall business strategy and I'll just um, pre reframe this with um, a lot of the CEOs we talk to, you know, creating their overall roadmap or their, uh, you know, and connecting into the business strategy is paramount. You already mentioned clarity. Is there a, a process that you've seen work? Is there an approach that you take to make sure that my technology investment and my outcomes are aligned? Because a lot of folks are really uh, um, scared about that risk and scared about what return that might be. I, th I think there's a lot of folks that have some scar tissue on uh, on dollars laid to waste. Yes, <laughs> I think I might be in that camp. <laughs> I, I think first leadership has to agree on strategic priorities. And, and as leaders, we have to think about that on an ongoing basis and, and reevaluate those. But then, you know, once we decide these are the, the priorities and where we wanna get to, and this kind of goes back to the the problems that we're solving now, the problems that we're going to solve next. The you know what is what is adjacent that we can solve, uh, and then evaluate how technology can enable those priorities. And you know it could be you know modernizing infrastructure, you know creating digital products or channels, uh, data analytics. But everything that we do, whatever the technology is, it has to tie back to a business goal. And not just be something that's cool or something that, that we see out there in the marketplace or somebody else is doing. So we have to do it too, but it has to tie back to a strategic goal. It has to be strategic for us, not just something that is cool or, or we're doing it because a competitor did. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, do you like, uh, what's your favorite uh, goal setting? Are you an EOS guy, an OKRs, smart goals? 
uh, what's your favorite strategy? We actually have a, a tool. Uh, it, it's something that I built within my other company, Champion Leadership, called the SaaS Fuel Operating System. Uh -huh. And so it takes uh, OKRs, it takes scaling up, it takes EOS, and that the best of all of those, all of them are built on the Rockefeller habits, and, and this is as well. Uh, but takes those, the, the best pieces of it, gets rid of some of the, uh, I would just say baggage, things that, that slow down. But so we work in a uh, you know, very similar way, but it's a, a SaaS tool. And so the entire company has visibility into those goals and that the KPIs that they have, uh, action items, everything all rolls up. So from the, the top, you know, here are the strategic goals and departments have goals underneath those that, that tie to those higher level KPIs. And then underneath that, um, the the line managers and, and individual contributors, they all have goals that that all roll up as well. So it really gets the entire organization uh, aligned with that. And then everything that we're doing, everything, every initiative has to tie back to a specific KPI, to a specific you know organizational goal. Otherwise, why are we doing it? Yeah, and so that's sure. something that's really helped us really keep focused. And when things come in that that don't fit any of those, we had to take a step back and okay, is this something that we really need to to look at our overall strategy? Did we get something wrong here? Do we need to reevaluate that? And we do that on an ongoing basis as well. Or is this something that is a shiny object? And there are so many of those that we look at and go, yep, that's really cool. And we'll put that on the someday maybe list, but it's not a right now thing. That's cool. Yeah. So we, we work in, in six week sprints. And so every six weeks, yeah, you know, we're doing this. So it's it's not just quarters. And you know, if you think about EOS and the quarterly rocks and those kinds of things, well, we we just cut that timeline in half, and so we're accelerating that that process. You know, so instead of you know four times a year, uh, we're going through eight cycles of that a year, and so we're able to iterate much faster, and and get much more done. Yeah, that's great. Um, I I think as a segue, uh, we see that um, folks kind of think of months. Uh, and then if you start to think of, okay, well, if that's my month, what could I do in a week? Yes. And so um, I like that. I'm starting to see a lot of business concepts that are kind of Einstein thinkers rather than Newton thinkers, right? So Newton is, hey, all time is, you know, time is finite. You have a limited amount of time. Uh, you know, time is very fixed. Einstein, it's relative. And I'm starting to see a lot of this relativity come into some of the business things like instead of thinking in a month, okay, think of it at a month, write all the stuff down you think you could get a month and try to get that done in a week or, or you know, and then right. what would that do, right, to, um, uh, you know, to your thought process just because like if we were holding on to a hot item time would literally stand still, right? Time would slow right. down. It would <laughs> feel like an eternity we were touching that hot item. Um, so uh, I think that's cool. But what lessons have you learned uh, from tech initiatives that failed to deliver expected value? Well, a lot. Uh, <laughs> a really hard lesson learned. It was uh, a couple of companies back was uh, the CRM rollout. And... Uh, you know, really having the, the team on board is important. If, if somebody doesn't use a system or use technology, there is no benefit from it. I mean, you can expect all the value you want, but if it's not utilized, we're not going to see the value. And that was one where the rollout was was not great. And the the team really saw it more as a compliance exercise. You know, Big Brother is watching and, and they're just taking all the fun out of what we're doing. Uh, you know, particularly in the, the sales side, which is where we really wanted to track things and with a CRM. And so, but they, they looked at it that way. This is a compliance thing. It's a have to. It wasn't an opportunity. They didn't see it as an opportunity to build capabilities or that would help them. They didn't see how it would benefit them. And so it really failed because you know, we as a leadership team didn't connect it to, to bigger goals and, and make adoption a, a clear priority. Really you know, show them, here's the benefit to doing this, you know, what's in it for you. So I think change management is really essential in making sure that any kind of a tech rollout goes well, because if, if people aren't using it or if they're using it, you know, just because they have to or doing the absolute minimum, the value is just not going to be there. Yeah, that's, um, we've done some RPA projects, robotic process automation, uh, especially around the secretary of state's filing process for LLCs and 
business formation, keeping companies into compliance. And there were these wonderful folks that knew everything about all 50 U.S. states and even some international things. I mean, they were just full of wonderful information, but they were having to hand crank these filings. I mean, it was a stare and compare um, problem. And we certainly um, had a tough time, A, winning their trust to say, hey, this automated process could work. Um, but we need you to help it work. And so where we kind of rested is, hey, you are still, um, it is still essential that you're monitoring this process and that you're still responsible for quality. We can't execute in a quality manner without your observation of this system. And just letting them know that that was still very important. Um, But that we would also give you credit for all of the work being done, not just the manual work that you do, but that we would say, hey, this right now, this is how many units of work we're getting done in a given interval with these uh, with these bots helping you, now you're going to be able to do this many. And um, and then, you know, you're not going to lose any team members, but team members may be able to go do other things that aren't being done today. And so we'd also kind of spell out some of those missing opportunities, those missed opportunities, because they're like value adds to the customer and kind of paint that picture of like, this isn't about people losing their jobs. This is about optimizing their jobs so that we can do new things for the customer and like showing them that future roadmap uh, of um, of what the current missed opportunities by not automating it were. And man, once they got those kinds of pieces, they were not only our biggest advocate, but they were also like, this spot isn't doing this right. You got to get this fixed, you know, this, <laughs> you know, right. and really, uh, really started to to set it off. But yeah, if you're just like, uh, you know, trying to incentivize them on, hey, this is a new way because it's better and and not feeling that engagement. Yeah, these these uh, kind of moving the uh, moving the cheese problems can be a little bit uh, difficult. Yeah, without a doubt. Cool. Well, um, how do you cultivate a culture of innovation and uh, digital fluency in your organization? Well, it's so important. And uh, yeah, it starts with uh, an agile framework. And and we use that not only in development, but throughout the organization. That's kind of where the, the six week sprints came from, is it, it's that agile framework of, uh, you know, constantly iterating, moving forward. Uh, we have innovation days. Uh, so teams can experiment. We do uh, tech training with uh, with our team. So we'll have somebody, a team member that has expertise in an area, teach the rest of the team. We've been doing monthly AI um, training for 18 months or so. And so we want everybody using that within their their role. And so, you know, part of it is us saying, you know, here's a, a way that you can use it, but also, you know, giving them the ability to figure out, you know, how how you can use this in your role. What are some ideas that you have and bring those back? So just having that discussion going has been really, really good. And it gets everybody involved uh, in the process and really kind of understanding um, you know, not only what's going on, but using technology, whether it's ours or whether it's AI or, or just, you know, understanding what's out there in the world that we may be, we may see something and say, hey, this would work really well inside our organization. Let's, let's try this. But uh, yeah, ultimately, leadership has to model the, the mindset and behavior. And I think that, again, it starts at the top. And that's really what makes the difference is we have to value that as leadership. And, and make that a priority for the team. Otherwise, it's just another thing to do or a thing on the list that would be really nice to do, but we're just, it's never going to rise to the top and we're not going to do it. So we have to make it a priority and just model that mindset of innovation and, and behavior and show them that it's important. Yeah. Do you think you have any unique mechanisms for recording or bringing you know, new ideas to the forefront? I would imagine you're talking about your cascading goals and roadmap through your tool quite often. Um, but any any interesting mechanism for how new ideas get surfaced? Well, I, we do it in in meetings. So it's something that uh, within the tool, they add issues to, to meetings or ideas or things to talk about discussion items, and we just go down the agenda. And so that it's something they don't have to think about it or write it down or remember to bring it up in a meeting. They just drop it in there and it shows up on the agenda uh, and we talk about it. I think it's, this is, you know, 
spring, summer, wildflower season. And I think about employee ideas like wildflowers and that they show up and they're, they're there. And then, you know, if you don't get a picture or do something with them now and they're, you know, you walk out the next day and it's like, they're gone. Like, well, what happened to that idea? Mm-hmm. And so we have to be able to, to capture those, you know, at, at the moment they bloom and otherwise if we don't, then they're gone and maybe gone forever or for another year. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I, I feel like sometimes I have um, a new big idea and it, really that's dangerous for me because I can get people kind of shifted around. And so I have to be very uh, diligent and disciplined that like, Hey, here's some idea. I think um, we should think about uh, get a read on the idea from the, from the different leadership or teammates. Yeah. That like, that is something that we should put some effort into trying out. Okay. Then let's put it on the list where I definitely really mess that up. And, and coming in, and, and I didn't realize it for, I don't know, probably way too long, years maybe, of, you know, I would have an idea and I'd come in and say, hey, guys, here, here's an idea and uh, and put it out there. And and then, you know, I would kind of forget about it or we'd document it and, and OK. And then, you know, they would be like, OK, here's what we did this idea. Like, I didn't know we were doing it. And it's just because I said it and because of the the position I'm in, they thought it was like, go do this. Right. And so then you know, it, it, after a few times of that, it's like, oh, I've, I've really got to pay attention to how I do this and how I present these ideas. Uh, this isn't a let's do this. This is just a, an idea of is this even worth talking about? Yeah, that's totally like making sure that that's clear. Yes, um, because I've derailed I, projects. I right, have yeah. uh, this wild idea that you know it maybe it's a phase two or three or never thing but you know it 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 broke a project because i you know i said this idea but didn't clarify that this is this is not a we should do this or go do this this is just uh should is, is, should we even think about this that's right that's right making sure it because i'm sure we use um i'm sure we use similar language and have a similar posture when we are driving you know, the de- de- predetermined execution, right? Like yes. you can't see our, our bright new idea. You could do it or you could not do it. I won't really feel bad or, uh, or like, Hey, like this has to get done. We probably, people probably experience us the same. Um, so yeah. being really clear and I've, I've had leaders, uh, that I've worked with same thing, you know, they can really throw, uh, something that they were thinking about five, six minutes before the meeting, they open the <laughs> meeting with that rather than sticking to the script of the the PowerPoint presentation that we had agreed right. to. Um, and then I catch myself doing the same thing, like, like, like stick, trust the process. And I think <laughs> I, as leaders, we also have to trust the process and, you know, put our bright new ideas at the, at the tail end of the list instead of letting them jump up to the top. That's cool that you also experienced that. Yeah. Well, cool. So what would you say to somebody who's starting their journey, starting their business growth, starting their digital transformation journey, or maybe even just starting their career? What's your, um, uh, you know, your best story for them or best piece of advice? I think, you know, give it time. Things are going to take longer to develop than than you expect. And, and if you're starting a business, starting career, you, you know, you have these, these big goals and dreams. And, and so dream big, absolutely do that. But also give yourself a, a little bit of grace that it's going to take longer than, uh, than maybe you think. It's going to be harder than you think. It's going to cost more than you think. And so, you know, give it time. You know, give it time to develop, but have those big dreams and, and don't give up on that. You know, keep pursuing, uh, you know, keep working at it. And, you know, starting the, the journey, you know, whether it's digital transformation or, you know, building a, a business, was say, don't boil the ocean. You know, focus on a quick win. So don't, you, you may have these giant dreams, giant projects, and this is something I've messed up uh, way more times than, than I want to admit. But, you know, here's the, the grand vision. Here's what we're going to do. Your th- here's the, the three-year strategic plan and, you know, the, the big, long to-do list. But if we can pick some small things off of that, what are the things that we can do in the next week, the next six weeks, the next sprint, this quarter? And what are the quick wins that we can create that will create momentum for our team, for our clients, for everybody involved in the project? 
And we definitely want to lay the foundation for that long-term vision. I mean, this it's a vision for a reason, but really breaking that down to, to what is it that is going to get a win quick uh, that's going to move things forward. And so that everybody really feels that the benefit to that early on, because that creates momentum. Yeah, you know, if you're looking at a you know a, a 50 mile hike or 20 mile hike, yeah, it, it's that's too much. But if you look at the first mile, and I just need to get from here to that tree over there, and then we're going to stop and we're going to celebrate. So build in those wins, focus on the wins, acknowledge the flops because they happen. And uh, you know, if you're in leadership, own that, but find the good and and celebrate that with your team. Celebrate those wins, but find the wins and build those in. That, uh, you know, hey, we got it to this tree, and now the next goal is we're going to get to that one over there. And that's really how you build that momentum and keep everybody motivated uh, along the journey because it it is it is hard, uh, but it is so worth it. Yeah, that's really cool. I, I also find a lot of times the meaning about a flop or a win comes from us, right? Like we generate yeah. those meetings. Oh, yeah. And so, um, you know, you can imagine a client uh, decides to go with a competitor, but you, you, you come to know exactly what it was that they liked about what the competitor did, what the, you know, what the pricing was, what the, like exactly why you lost that business to that competitor. Now, is that a, is that a really a bad thing that just happened? Like you got the most perfect, um, Intel as to why someone chose someone else other than you. So like, to me, that's a win. Cause now I can go take that back and I can correct all those things. How could I have, um, cr- you know, it would have, most people don't even get into a position where they can know exactly brass tacks, you know, why that choice right. was made. So is that a, is that a flop? No way. That's, um, uh, you know, Jocko has that thing like good, every, you know, even the bad yeah. things are are really good <laughs> because of the things that they teach you or they drive you to. And um, uh, it sound, sounds a lot like your experiences, like the wins are awesome. Um, and then we just find out the kind of the positive outcomes we can create from the flops. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of that meaning comes from us and what we how we respond. It definitely does. Cool. Well, it's been, um, if people like what you had uh, to share today, um, how should they connect with you? And uh, feel free to also explain uh, your SaaS product that you might have in the, uh, in the market for the goals and the leadership. Um, you're, I know you, you run a mastermind group, um, so feel free to also uh, articulate that. But how could people continue the conversation with you? Sure. You can find me on every social platform. It's at Jeff, middle initial K, last name Mains, at Jeff K Mains. Uh, website, championleadership.com. Um, SaaS product is intelligentcontacts.com. It's for, for healthcare. And, uh, and our SaaS for the goal setting, it's, it's called the SaaS Fuel Operating System. You can learn more about that at championleadership.com as well. Awesome. Well, it's been great speaking with you today. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to... Um, Uh, excited to see where this year takes you. Thanks, Ben. It's great being on the show. 